Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about aggregators in the news industry and the issues faced by media firms when deciding whether to charge for access to their content. So the news industry is one of many industries that has been fundamentally changed by the internet. Uh, consumers have more choice than ever before and barriers to entry have been removed. Firms with very different backgrounds, so firms that were traditionally broadcast media and now having to uh, compete against each other, so broadcast media have to compete against newspapers and so on. And firms that were previously small local monopolists, say uh, city-based newspapers in the US, now have to um, compete against national newspapers and so on from other countries. And the market's become extremely globalised. And I think these two statistics here just give you a sense of how much choice consumers have um, and how much more global the market's become. So in 2010, 73% of the Daily Mail's online readers were from outside the UK. And The Guardian has more online readers in the US than the LA Times. So what I do in this paper is I focus on two issues which I think are specific to the online news industry. The first is that online, firms have recently been trying to search for a successful business model. And what we've seen emerge in the last few years are very sharp divergences in the pricing strategies used by different firms. And there are two aspects to this. First of all, if we think about across content areas, by, and by a content area I mean something like general news or entertainment news or financial news, we see that so, in some areas most content is charged for, say financial news, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times charge for access to their content, they were amongst the first to start charging, whereas in other areas like entertainment news the vast majority of content is provided for, for free. So one motivation one thing I want to ask is, what are the characteristics of an, a, a content area like financial news that means that more, more often than not, financial news is charged for, as opposed to something like entertainment news? The second issue is that even if we focus within a content area, so take general news, we see that some um, firms charge for access to content that is similar in many ways to content being provided for free elsewhere. So a good example here, and the one that sort of got me interested in this in the first place is the Times versus the Guardian. So the Times charges for access to all of its content whereas the Guardian provides free access to all its content and that means that often I can read an article for free on the Guardian whereas I'd have to pay for a very similar article that's available on the Times. So another motivation that I had was to try and see can we explain is this an equilibrium? Can we have a model where this is an equilibrium outcome? The second issue that I want to focus on are the rise of aggregators, so things like big news, Google News, and so on, um, as a new institution in the media market, and their role in allowing consumers to search and switch amongst different media providers. And I want to, and there's been a debate within the industry and amongst policymakers as to what the effects these aggregators are having on the industry. So I want to ask, I want to try, I think this is my model provide some answers, some indications as to what are the effects these aggregators may be having on consumers, on firms, and on content quality. So those are the sort of the broad aims. So I want to begin by just motivating those and explaining why I think they're interesting questions, and then go into more details about the model and so on. Yeah. Um, so I think my impression is that Huffington Post has m moved further away from, has moved more towards being sort of one of the media firms, whereas it started out being more like one of these aggregators. Um, so now I think if you'd asked me this question two years ago or a year ago, I would have said the Huffington Post was an aggregator, whereas now I'd think of it more as a, a media firm, and it's very much more a focus on things like Google News and these things that are just collecting links together and s sending you off elsewhere. Okay, so first of all, the search for a business model. And so I'm going to focus very much on what's been happening in the newspaper industry. And one of the big motivations for the newspaper industry and the need to find a successful online business model is because their offline business model is basically collapsing. So the traditional media business model has been one where by content is provided free or at very low cost to consumers, and the vast majority of revenue is earned through advertising. 
and offline for the newspapers in particular, both sides of this model are collapsing. So if we look at what's happened in, to circulation, this chart here plots print circulation in the US in millions from 1990 to uh, 2011. And you can see throughout this period there's a decline. And in fact, this goes way back into the 1950s and even further. Yes? So is it, when do we see the beginning of the, of the web? 1996? Uh, yeah, although I'd say that it's more around 2003, 2004, where a significant number of people have broadband and so on. So really reading large amounts of news and content online becomes a serious. It's, it's interesting that we see a decline even from 1990 to 1990. Yeah, and, and this goes much, this is like a 50, 60 year decline, long term decline in, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the interesting thing is that once we get to this sort of time, the last 10 years or so, that decline has become much sharper. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, and see just how much is, how much is accelerated, yeah. Um, so yeah, and other, and other sorts of media, yeah. Okay, so print circulation in the US has fallen by 20% from 2003 to 2010. And what's made this even worse is that advertising revenues have basically fallen off the cliff over that time period. As... So things like classifieds um, and all sorts of other advertising that newspapers made a lot of their money from have found other outlets, particularly online, where it's just more, product, more efficient for them to advertise rather than in the newspapers. So the blue line here is print advertising revenue. As you can see, it's fairly stable, or it appears to be, over those three years to 2006, and then it's just dropped drastically. Um, Um, so, um, I think part of it's to do with the economic oh, right. cr crisis. So there was a bit of a, a sort of, it's really bad in this period. It drops rapidly and then it sort of tapers off a little bit. Because this, so what we have simultaneously is sort of an economic crisis and huge jumps in things like, so Craigslist gets set up and classifies just abandoned local newspapers. Um, so it's a combination of that, and then things start. Let I mean things are still pretty bad here, but not as bad as they were during this earlier period. Yeah, that's right. You would have thought it would after two thousand nine. Yeah. So the market's the market's still growing then, until until as recently as then, and then it just collapses. The offline their print advertising revenue. So yeah, yeah, so their total advertising revenues were growing. And uh, again, as, even though we'd seen total circulation falling from the 1950s, total advertising revenues, print advertising revenues have been rising throughout that period. Uh, I'm not sure. So yes, it might possibly be just the inflation, I should check that. Um, does this also include sponsor search advertising? No, so, um, online. On, online, this is just any online advertising revenue that the media site, that a media site might have. The media site? Yeah, that the media sites might have. This is, so, this is the print advertising revenues in media firms and the online advertising revenues earned by the same set of Media. No, so it wouldn't be sponsored church, no. Um, okay, so the offline business model of these firms has basically fallen apart, and they found that the, the, the online model that they used at least to begin with, which was centered around free content provision and relying solely on advertising revenue, hasn't filled the gap um, because online advertising revenues haven't been as profitable as they'd hoped. So you can see the red line here is online rev advertising revenues, and although they've been growing, they pale in comparison to the offline advertising revenues. So I'm going to talk about uh, the key thing here. Uh, I know you have a financial theory in your short time, but I've always wondered that you, you know, a key element in this whole story is there's lots of advertising going on mm -hmm. with information aggregators like Google, with Bing, and so on. So 
so not advertising overall is not declined. No. Right? Yeah. So I was wondering whether you have some data on another green line shooting up. Oh, showing so another source. Advertising. Yeah, and just for the comparison. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, that might give you a sense as well of when this is just due to the economic conditions and how much this is due to sort of the classifieds or whatever. Oh. Yep. So we know that in 2011, Google on its own has $30 billion revenue. So okay. And this is, so that's there, is yeah, it? Right. Yeah. So that's just Google. Yeah. So you have to be able to, yeah, I mean, that would be very worthwhile. Mm, the comparison. Okay. Okay, so firms are trying to find a new um, business strategy online, and what we're seeing is, is them moving in one of two directions. This is summed up by this quote for The Economist. So for every outfit that's trying to build a subscription service, another seems to be becoming more convinced of the um, virtues of giving away free content. So we see two groups of firms. The first, firms like the Daily Mail, the Guardian, the CNN, seem to believe that they can rely solely on... Um, free content model with earning their revenues from advertising, um, so long as they achieve sufficient scale. On the other hand, a group of firms like the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times are beginning to charge for access to their content and erecting paywalls. And these paywalls come in a variety of forms. So the most extreme is the type used by the Times or the Sunday Times who charge for access to all of their content. You can't view anything, at least not that's been recently written by the Times without paying for it. And they even go to the extent of preventing aggregators, search engines, from presenting their um, articles amongst search results. A more common model is to have some form of metered paywall, by, whereby you can view a certain number of articles for free within a given time period, or some articles will be provided for free, say general news, whereas editorial pieces that will be charged for. Okay. But both sets of firms, both approaches face challenges. So begin by thinking about the firms who charge for access to their content. Well, the evidence suggests, research suggests that generally there's quite a low willingness to pay for consumers. Uh, so the Boston Consulting Group in 2009 found that consumers said they'd be willing to pay about $5 a month to access content. And in addition, not only does it seem that the vast majority of consumers, sorry, not only does it seem that consumers aren't willing to pay very much, but there's also a very large group of consumers who say they're not willing to pay anything at all. So the Times found that when they implemented their paywall, apparently their page views dropped by 90%. And the Pew Research Center did a survey where they asked consumers, would you continue to use your favorite site if it started charging? And 82% said they'd go elsewhere. So it seems that if you're going to charge, you might earn subscription revenues, but you're going to have to focus on a much narrower group of loyal customers. On the other hand, if you're going to go for a free access model, you might be able to attract a much broader group of consumers, but you have to rely solely on advertising revenues. And it seems that that requires substantial scale if it's going to be sustainable, um, and that's going to require costly investments in your website and your infrastructure and, so, and your reporting and so forth. Okay, so what I want to do in this paper is I want to ask what determines a firm's pricing strategy? And there are two aspects to this. First of all, I want to ask, can we see um, this sort of Times versus Guardian outcome? Can we see some firms charging for access to content that's similar to uh, that being provided elsewhere? And I'll prevent, present a model and a framework that um, generates this as an equilibrium outcome. Then I want to ask why are certain types of news, financial news in particular, amongst the first to charge, um, whilst most entertainment news is provided for free? What is, it, what is it about financial news, the characteristics of financial news that means that it's mainly charged for? And the model will provide an explanation based upon differences in consumer loyalty, the willingness to pay of consumers, and the extent of media market competition. That second issue that I mentioned was I want to focus on aggregators, so Google, News, Bing, News, Dig.com, things like that, which are becoming an increasingly significant source of traffic for these firms. So George and Hogendorn did a recent paper where they suggested that as much as 40 to 50% of a media site's traffic will, be, will arrive via an aggregator. And there's been a lot of debate about how these aggregators are affecting firms in the industry. So uh, Rupert Murdoch, amongst others, has accused the aggregators of stealing the content provided by the media firms by basically collecting together 
much of the useful information um, and not send, redirecting consumers through to the site. So they're basically free riding on the content that these sites are providing and then advertising revenues without compensating the uh, underlying content provider or the media firm. But additionally, these firms, these aggregators are also allowing consumers to search and identify the content that they might be interested in. And they're allowing consumers to switch between firms and thus increasing competition between different media providers. And it's these latter two effects that I'm going to focus on here. Uh, these aggregators have also attracted attention from policymakers. So both the FTC and the OECD have done recent reports on the state of the news industry, where one of the things they talked about was, or they were concerned with, was how aggregators were affecting the industry. So what the model does, um, what I try to do with the model, is think about what are the effects of aggregators on content quality, consumer welfare, and firm profitability. And the motivation for looking at content quality comes from mainly from these reports, because something that's often cited in, this, in these reports is a concern about the quality of the content that might be provided and how aggregators will affect that quality, because um, what they're often worried about is the role that media play in the political process. And they view high quality content as things like investigative journalism and so on, and they're worried that if aggregators reduce the quality of the content, then there'll be less investigative journalism, there'll be less uh, holding politicians to account by media firms, and that will then feed back into the political process and so on. And my results will show that, yes, aggregators harm firms in the sense that they reduce their profitability, but those costs to firms need to be weighed up against the benefits that consumers get in terms of increases in welfare, and that the effects on content quality are rather subtle. Different types of content will be affected differently. In particular, we'll see that as more consumers use aggregators, the quality of the content that's charged for will decrease, uh, charged for will decrease whereas the, content, the quality of the content that's provided for free will increase. Okay, so that's what I want to try and do in the model, just to, uh, uh, just to provide a bit of context, a brief discussion of some of the related literature. So, the model is going to be a mo model of media market competition, and there's an extensive literature modeling media market competition in, sen in terms of two-sided markets, with the seminal paper being that of Anderson and Code. Now, the difference here in my model is that I focus on vertical rather than horizontal differentiation, which is the focus of the existing literature. And the motivation for that is that the policy debate is focused on, much of the debate about aggregators are focused on how they're affecting product quality, and so implicitly we need to talk about vertical aspects of competition more so than horizontal aspects. So the existing literature isn't really equipped um, to begin addressing some of the questions that are specific to the online news industry. There's also a, a literature looking at aggregators, um, and most of the economics literature is focused on price aggregators. So um, the early paper by Varian in 1980 and then Bay and Morgan in 2001. And the methodology that I'm going to use is closely related to the methodology used to model price aggregators, so price comparison websites and so on. And for those of you who are familiar with it, the variant paper is uh, pretty similar to this one. It's a nice, way, a nice starting point to think about what the, how the model works and what the incentives are and what the trade-offs are that the firm faces. Uh, so more closely related to this paper is the literature on content aggregators. So most of this literature that I'm aware of anyway has been uh, empirical. So Susan Afey and Marcus and, both, and Chu and Tucker both have empirical papers looking at how aggregators affect the type of content that different consumers, um, that, that consumers uh, view. And the closest paper is this paper by Della Rocco et al. in 2011, who look at the effects of content um, of, aggregate, of aggregators on two firms who make content investments and can hyperlink to each other. And um, in contrast, I'm going to focus on how aggregators affect pricing decisions. And also, um, this, this De La Rocca paper, they don't really have a, a consumer side of the economy. So thinking about how aggregators affect consumers and so on isn't really possible. Whereas I'll ha explicitly model consumers and so be able to have a more general welfare analysis. Finally, and I'll elaborate on this later in more detail, but the methodology that I use here and is used in these price aggregator papers can be viewed as a, a form of all-pay auction. 
And so that's going to be useful when we try and think about what the equilibrium, how, what the equilibrium strategies look like. Um, and so I'm going to call on some results from that literature. Okay, so let's actually move into the model itself now. So the model is one shot, a uh, static model, so you can think of it as the market for a single news story. And there are N firms competing in the market who make costly content inv investments, um, which is X, and subscription price decisions. And they make those decisions simultaneously. So you can think a story arrives, it has a set of facts associated with it, and then firms can invest in editorial pieces, background research, uh, getting expert opinions and so on, which will improve upon the quality of the articles or the stories that they have. And the key feature of the model is that some consumers will use aggregators to select which firm they're going to consume from based upon the quality of the article that's provided. Okay. So the consumer side of the model. So what I want to do is I want to just set up uh, my assumptions and then I'll try and provide some stylized facts to justify those assumptions about consumer behavior. So each consumer I gets utility delta UX minus lambda IP from content of quality X provided at price P. So delta is a parameter which uh, captures the willingness to pay of consumers for a particular type of content. So it would be the same for all consumers for a given story, but it could differ depending on what the story is. Uh, U is just an increasing in concave utility function. And one aspect of heterogeneity across consumers comes in their aversion to prices. So lambda I is consumer I's aversion to prices. Okay, so there's going to be a unit mass of consumers, and they are going to be of one of two types. So the first type I refer to as law subscribers, and these are consumers for whom lambda I is equal to one. So the implication of that is that these are consumers who are going to be willing to pay to access content. And I also assume not only are they willing to pay, but they have a single most preferred firm. Each of these consumers has a single most preferred firm, and that's going to be the only firm they consider consuming from. So you could think perhaps these are consumers who uh, have very ingrained political beliefs, and they like to read something that confirms their pre-existing views and biases, and so they only consider one media firm, and that's the only firm they go to. Um, so these consumers are willing to pay, but only consider one firm. And I assume there's symmetry across the media firm, so each media firm has the same mass of loyal subscribers. The second type of consumer is what I refer to as searchers. So these are consumers for whom the, their aversion to price is arbitrarily large, with the implication being that they're never going to be willing to pay to access content. Um, on the other hand, I also assume they have no ex-ante preferences across the different media firms. So that in principle, they're willing to consume from any media firm, so long as it's providing free content. And I also assume that they're fully informed of the content levels provided by the different media firms. And my interpretation of that is that these are consumers who are using aggregators, and the algorithm used by the aggregator can identify which firm is providing the highest qu quality level and can direct consumers towards that quality level. Um, so there are two types of consumers, law subscribers who will pay but only consider one site, and searchers who will never pay but will consider in principle any site. Okay, so what's the justification? Yes? Yes. But the quality estimates aren't ingrained. So it's not like um, there's a bunch of right-wing and a bunch of left-wing people, neither of whom are willing to pay for the articles, but they have very different, pro uh, different profiles in what they continue to consider to be high quality. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone views quality in the same, same way. Um, OK, so first stylized fact is that uh, there are a large group of consumers who switch between sites and visit any given site infrequently. So 64% of a site's visitors averaged only one visit per month in 2011. Additionally, not only are consumers switching, but those consumers who switch the most are using aggregators to identify which firm they're going to consume from. So AFSL found that the concentration of a user's consumption was strongly negatively related to their use of aggregators. So there's this large group of consumers who are switching and using aggregators to do so. In addition, the vast majority of consumers don't appear to be willing to pay to access content. 
82% in that Pew Research Center survey that I, that I cited earlier. So the behavior of this large group of consumers who are switching using aggregators and may not be willing to pay to access content is reflected in the behavior of the searches. On the other hand, there's also some consumers who appear to prefer to read news stories which confirm pre-existing news and biases, so these, their behavior is reflected in these loyal customers. Yes? Um, so, yeah, my interpretation is that those, those are consumers who just want to know the information, say, and want to know who, who's providing the best story, and the aggregator allows them to do that, whereas there are these other groups of consumers who will always go, they'll never, they'll never go to Google News, they'll go to the New York Times and just read the New York Times instead. And, If you, Use it, using yeah. Aggregator. So if, if I am a, a strong left-wing views and I can't find what I want in the Guardian, I may go in the aggregator. Aggregator and, and yeah. So I'm yeah. So I'm ig I'm, ig I'm ignoring. I'm, ig what? I'm ignoring that sort of effect because I'm ba basically I'm going to assume that every firm in the market provides every story. So if you went to the Guardian, you'd find the story. The Guardian would provide it. Yes. I have a short question about the notion of quality here. So how, I mean, it sounds to me extremely difficult to even put it into a number. So how do you, how do you justify it? I mean, in a sense of, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a large population that thinks that, you know, a quality article is the latest news about Snooki. And, you know, that's, and that's absolutely fine. It's a different kind of idea of quality than what, you know, what you would consider quality. So some people don't like to read very long editorials. So hmm. they don't want to. Okay, so this could be... You know, and as you said, it also is related to political views. So, you know, just kind of like, you know, to, to, to aggregate all of it into one, one number that would be supposed to kind of uh, signify one measure of quality seems, I don't know, how, how, how do you do that? So I, I suppose I'm, I'm focusing very much on a single story. So you might think that in certain stories, you could, it's far easier to think about what quality is. So if it's entertainment news, you don't want everyone's past in, in history. You just want the basic gossip and, so, and timeliness and so on. So perhaps if, you folk, if you're thinking about a single news story, it might be a lot easier to think of what is quality. And it could be different things for different news stories. So in entertainment news, it might just be timeliness. In political news, it might be in-depth analysis and insights and so on. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Um, it's, it's just like you know, for Google News, for example, like most of the Google News visits come from, well, not from the Google News homepage, but they come from either Google, you know, and then they click on the news section, mm -hmm. or they come from a search in Google News. But, uh, but I mean, you read these papers, I mean, like if you're a Google News user, a news or whatever, you, you read them differently than the non newspapers. The search is very important. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. Okay, so let's try and get a move on. So there's a unit mass of consumers and a proportion mu of these are going to be searches. So I interpret mu throughout as the importance of the aggregator. Okay, so there are n firms and they select their quality and their subscription price. But every firm also earns some advertising revenue and I take advertising just to be exogenous. So for any consumer who comes to your site, regardless of the type of consumer that it is, um, or the pricing strategy you're following, you just earn some revenue beta. And then uh, content investments are costly, so they have a convex cost function. Okay, so this is where I was gonna link it to the all-pay auction literature, but basically you can view the model as a form of all-pay auction, and from that literature we know that there's a unique symmetric mixed strategy equilibrium to this model. So that's gonna be the one that I focus on. And in that equilibrium, every firm will provide content for free with probability alpha star. They'll select, if they charge, they select a unique quality level X star M and set a price that extracts all the surplus from their loyal customers. 
And if they provide free content, then they start randomizing in their content investment, selecting from a distribution, which will be over an interval from zero to some upper bound. OK. So uh, I think I was just going to discuss what the profits of the firms look like. But if we skip this, basically the trade-off that's going to drive all the results is that if a firm charges for access to its content, it earns subscription revenues from its loyal subscribers, but it will lose out on the possibility of attracting the aggregator's traffic. And it's this tension that the firm has to resolve and which will drive the results in the model. Okay, so let's actually look at the equilibrium. So if this condition holds, which basically just says that the searches are a sufficiently attractive source of traffic, then they, so you want to compete for them, then alpha star will be positive, and we begin by this expression here, but will be strictly less than one. Whereas on the other hand, if this condition doesn't hold, alpha star equals zero, and every firm charges for access to their content with certainty. So we can make two comments already at this stage. First of all, when firms randomize between free content provision and charging, then cross-sectionally will generate the mixture of pricing strategies that we observe. Well, for a given story, we'll see that some firms charge for access to that story, whereas others provide um, free access to it. Secondly, alpha star equal to one, that's everyone providing free access to content with certainty is not an equilibrium outcome in this model. And intuitively that's because if everyone were to provide free access, there would be a Bertrand effect. Content levels would be bid up, profits would be bid down to zero, but everyone has the outside option of charging their loyal customers, which earns them strictly positive profits, so there's a profitable deviation from that strategy. And I think that's consistent with what, if we, what we've, if, with what we've seen online. We saw everyone jump online, provide all their content for free, compete very intensively. They found it hasn't been profitable, and now they've begun to shift towards other pricing strategies. Okay. Then with probability 1 minus alpha star, you charge, you set this price, and you select the quality level determined by this first order condition. With probability alpha star, you provide content for free. We can solve for the distribution and the upper bound of that distribution. And we can also pin down the expected profits of the media firm, which are given by the profits they can earn if they charge their loyal customers, because they either always strictly prefer to charge or are indifferent between charging and not charging. Okay. So that's the description of the equilibrium. Let's look at some comparative statics and try and get a few more. Yes? Sorry, but um, not quite. So, so you were trying to model something that you observed in the real world. Mm -hmm. So now you tell us that for the model that you came up with, that you try, hope captures important yeah. aspects, what you get is a mixed equilibrium. How does a firm play a mixed equilibrium? Uh, strategy? So you, you could think perhaps this is a, a static version of a longer game and the story is continuously arising, and alpha might be the proportion of all those stories that you charge for. But so. So some of these, some of these metered payables perhaps come a bit closer to that in terms that sometimes an article will be charged for, sometimes will be provided for free. But I agree. So I mean, be categorized not by randomness, but rather by either the category or a certain free quota, which presumably serves to attract customers and convince them of the quality of yeah. content rather than the randomization strategy. So I think, yeah, so this is a problem that I've... I've uh, admit this is a problem with the model. It's a problem that the price comparison literature, so the Varian model and the Bain Morgan model, have, have had to face as well because they've used basically similar strategies and then have had to say, well, how do we interpret um, these strategies? Um, so I have sort of, I have interpretations, but they don't map quite so well into reality. And the one final thing I would say is that this is symmetric. Equilibrium, there are a, a continuum of asymmetric equilibria, and some of those you can have an arbitrary, arbitrary number of firms who always charge for access to their content. What is more troubling is having many firms who always provide free content because then you just get this Bertrand effect again. So we can go some way to resolving those problems with asymmetric equilibria. Um, Yep. Whereas in practice, if you were having a pay, you know, system, you would go off, you would come off, you would go 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 off, you
I think the way to respond to this in the data would be to actually look at, you know, across the, in a time series, if you see that firms are switching around, then that would make this. And in some applications, you get that. Maybe that's, is that, if you see what I mean, yeah. cross section maybe this is. Five minutes, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's look at some of the comparative stocks. So what happens when you charge? You do so with probability 1 minus alpha star and you provide this quality level X star M. And it's possible to show that both of these increase when, first of all, fewer consumers use aggregators, so when mu is lower, when consumers have a higher willingness to pay, delta is higher, and when advertising revenues are lower, beta is lower. So we can use those results to perhaps suggest why we observe differences in pricing strategies across content areas. So the example I had at the start was the Financial Times, the Financial News versus Entertainment News. And that, that stylized observation translates into a prediction that alpha is higher in the entertainment news sector than it is in the financial news sector. And those previous comparative statics suggest some reasons that I think are, sound reasonably plausible. First of all, it could be that more consumers use aggregators to search for entertainment news. So mu is higher in the entertainment news sector. Um, and why do I think that's reasonable? Well, if you think in entertainment news, you often don't really care who you get the news from. You just want access to the information. So you're willing to go to any site. Whereas in financial news, you might be more likely to be loyal to a given site because the opinion pieces are more important and, um, and factors like that. Another possible factor might be that um, there's a higher willingness to pay for financial news. And again, I think this is feasible, realistic, if you think about... Um, what financial news is often used for. It's often used by business people and so on who have a very high willingness to pay, whereas most entertainment news, yeah, sure, it's great fun, but how much more value than that does it have? Finally, um, I had that condition earlier that was required for Alpha Star to be strictly positive, and it's possible to show that as N increases, that con for a set of parameters, that condition is more likely to be fulfilled. So one possible explanation might be that we're in financial news, we have a small number of firms who are competing, whereas most firms provide some form of entertainment news. So we're actually just in financial news, we're just in an equilibrium where everyone charges, whereas in entertainment news, we're in an equilibrium where firms might begin randomizing. Okay. And then we can also talk about what happens to these content distributions. So this content, the free content distribution, um, this is the content distribution for one, that one firm selects from. But we're also interested in what's the con quality of the content consumed through the aggregator. <coughs> and that's given by the highest, um, that's the distribution of the highest free quality level. So it's possible to derive an expression for that distribution. And then it's possible to show that both distributions can be ranked in terms of stochastic dominance relationships. In particular, as mu increases, so as mu goes from mu to mu prime, the distributions associated with mu prime will first order stochastically dominate those associated with mu. And from that, we then get the welfare, some welfare implications that can contribute to that policy debate that I mentioned at the start. So if we think about what happens as more consumers use the aggregator as mu increases. First of all, the results that we have suggest that there are contradictory effects on product quality. Um, the expected free quality level of a firm increases and the expected quality of the content consumed through an aggregator increases from those stochastic dominance results, whereas the quality of the content that's charged for decreases. And so if policymakers are worried about content quality, then they need to think carefully about, perhaps think carefully about what types of quality, content they're talking about. Secondly, um, it's possible to show that the expected profits of the firm decrease. And this is consistent with the noises that have been made by media firms. They've been very much leading the charge and the complaints against aggregators. And intuitively, what's happening is that as more consumers use aggregators, more consumers are switching between firms, and there's greater competition that the aggregators are being exposed to. Um, thirdly, although firms may suffer, consumers benefit as more consumers as aggregator use increases. So the expected utility of both a loyal subscriber and a searcher increases with, uh, with mu. So just to summarize, yes, aggregators may harm firms, but these detrimental effects on firms need to be weighed up against the benefits to consumers, and different types of, of content are affected in different ways. Okay, so, um, so I've already mentioned this Briefly, um, 
I've focused on the symmetric equilibrium. There are a continuum of asymmetric equilibrium in this model, and we can address some of the, perhaps some of the issues that um, have people that might be raised in terms of how we interpret these strategies. Um, but in the paper, I have a, a particular example, which is of uh, one firm who always provides free access to content. And so you could interpret that as a public broadcaster. And actually, I show that that doesn't change any of the results. In fact, all those distributions and so on are the same for the, for the, uh, the private media firms. Um, and I have a number, of, a number of other extensions, but perhaps if I just wrap up and then... Um, okay, so in this paper, I develop a model in which ex-ante identical media firms pursue different pricing strategies. And this generates the cross-sectional variation in pricing strategies that we observe um, online. Uh, and the model suggests reasons as to um, why we observe different pricing strategies in different content areas. And I also think the model provides some insights into this policy debate about the effects of aggregators by emphasizing the potential benefits to consumers as well as the costs to firms of increased aggregator use. So thank you very much.